Great. Kia ora tato and welcome to the second session of this EDF series on well-being. And we're really happy to have um, Spencer Banzath again, this time in the leading role, um, to discuss um, anthropocentrism and intrinsic value. Spencer is the Professor of Economics at Georgia State University. Uh, some of you, like me, will remember him from a much earlier role at Resources for the Future. Um, and he, he's worked on a very wide range of issues, but is someone who always thinks very deeply about issues and looks at things in a different way than the standard one. So we're hoping to benefit from that today. And he's going to speak for about 45 minutes. And uh, Spencer, are you happy to take questions of clarification as you go, or would you like Absolutely, to? Absolutely, sure. Whatever, whatever works best. Okay, so. Uh, I'm not very good at monitoring chat, so if someone will just interrupt verbally, that would be better. Right. So you can put something in the chat um, and uh, we can manage that. Or if we're not noticing, please feel free to, to turn your speaker on and interrupt. Um, and then we have the great pleasure of some wise comments, putting the pressure on there, Paul, <laughs> in response by Paul Kelleher, uh, who is a professor at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's a philosopher. Uh, and we've had the great pleasure of having Paul involved in an experimental dialogue that we just completed, uh, looking at equity and justice issues and um, how to think differently about uh, decision making and how equity can be brought effectively into decision making processes. So that's possibly not what he's talking about today, but I'm sure he'll have interesting things to say as well. So I'll pass over to you, Spencer. Thank you. Okay, let me share my screen. Um, thank you, Susie, for um, the introduction and thank you even more um, for uh, inviting me um, to spend some time with you uh, guys today. Um, it's my understanding that uh, you all at EDF has been, have been having a discussion about what it means um, to be more people-centered as we think about environmental policy. And so I wanted to pick up on that here today to talk about what does people-centered mean? Uh, what has it meant to different people over time? To what extent does it mean that we have to be materialistic in our policy? To what extent does it mean we're narrowly instrumentalist in our policy, just taking what, you know, what is useful for people and what it means um, more generally? So um, to start that, discussion, I thought I would kind of take a historical approach and, and tell a narrative about how some of the, these ideas came into economics in the formation of environmental economics itself. I, th I believe that the most important person um, for those developments, for creating something called environmental economics, where we could think about these questions, think about the environment from um, a people-centered approach is John Crutilla. And in particular, his essay, Conservation Reconsidered, which was published in the American Economic Review in 1967. In that title, Conservation Reconsidered, you can tell that he's referring to an earlier debate, which I think is really the, the key context in which he was working. So I want to go back to that earlier debate between Gifford Pinchot and John Muir. Uh, to outstanding um, architects of the American conservation and preservationist movements in the 19th century. Pinchot uh, was a trained forester from a very privileged background. He went to uh, Yale he, uh, and, and then Europe, became um, one of America's first professional foresters, founded the um, American Forestry Society, um, one of the first chiefs of the Forest Service, uh, later on in his life, he founded the Yale School of Forestry and eventually become governor of Pennsylvania. So very privileged background. He um, was a utilitarian who believed that conservation should be for um, human purposes. So uh, he uh, extended Bentham's maxim of utility to be about um, the greatest good for the greatest number for the longest period of time. And he really wanted to emphasize that longest period of time part. He felt that laissez-faire economics was not very good at that. 
that the market did not work to maximize utility. It was very wasteful. And so we needed um, a kind of rationalist um, planning to um, impose order on the market and make sure we conserved our resources for human goods for that, for that longest period of time. And so that led to what he called the wise use of resources as kind of a, of a motto. Um, his utilitarianism was also um, paired with a kind of materialism. So he said there are only two things in this world, humans and resources. So to him, utility meant a kind of materialistic benefit. John Muir couldn't be more his opposite. Um, John Muir um, grew up um, with uh, immigrant parents who did not even know how to read. Um, he never got much higher education, a little bit, but was never able to finish a degree because of um, financial pressures. He was working at, in a machine shop one day when an accident left him blind. He feared permanently. It turned out only to be for a few months. But then he decided, you know, life was too short to do anything but live for his passions. So he famously walked um, from Indiana to the Gulf and then went to the Sierra Mountains where, you know, he did his life's work um, preserving um, um, the Sierras in the area that became known as Yosemite. In contrast to Pinchot's utilitarianism, Muir was very anti-utilitarian, anti-anthropocentric. So he argued that nature was not for our good, it was good for itself. And we shouldn't begrudge, say, a rattlesnake its life just because it's not good for humans, at least not in any um, narrow material way. Now, Pincho and Muir, for a while there, around, say, 1890, they were tactical allies, at least, against laissez-faire, which Muir called the, the gobble-gobble school of economics because it was gobbling everything up, and, and they agreed on that. So they were tactical allies there for, for a while until um, they started serving on some committees together and so forth and ended up disagreeing on just about every um, particular policy question. Muir wanted to preserve nature for its own sake. Pinchot wanted wise use. And he accused Muir of just trying to lock up nature to save it from humans instead of using it for humans. And their fight reached a, an epic clash um, when it, uh, there was a decision to be made about damming the Hetch Hetchy Valley in Yosemite, Muir's um, prize work, prize um, preserved land. Uh, uh, the city of San Francisco, which had just had a big fire, wanted to um, dam the, the valley as a source of municipal water supplies. And Muir was apoplectic about it. He said, damn, da damn, Hetch Hetchy. Lots of uh, um, puns on damn with and without the end. Damn Hetch Hetchy, you might as well you know, talk about damn the, the, the nation's cathedrals for its resources. This is um, something that is beyond material use. It's, it's too beautiful and important in and of itself. Pinchot said, yes, I understand your point, but as I look at the use of things, um, you know, and, and do my utilitarian calculus, it's clear that the need for San Francisco is too great. So yes, it's beautiful, but sorry, beauty has to go for wise use and we have to damn it. In the end, Pinchot um, won that debate. It was damned and um, they were um, mortal enemies uh, from, then, from then on. The difference between Pinchot and Muir is really important, I think, for understanding the future of how environmental economics merged, because it's not just a debate about values. Muir valued beauty, the existence of nature. Pinchot valued material resources. That was certainly part of it. But it was also a question about how they approached politics. To Muir, material wealth and natural beauty and ecosystem functions, those were incommensurable things that you could just not, you just couldn't weigh them in any kind of um, Benthamite kind of utilitarian calculus. Different things, you can't, you know, as you said with that example of the cathedrals, you might as well talk about weighing something like religion and material wealth. To Pinchot, um, 
we had to do rationalist planning in a utilitarian kind of way. And furthermore, it had to be materialistic. So therefore, nature could never count. There was no room for nature in uh, his politics, or at least not for you know, nature, the value of nature in and of itself. It could only be for humans. So their approach to politics in that respect was, was what divided them even more. And that just left a real impasse in um, nascent American environmentalism and environmental policy. And you can see that impasse and the frustration with it at early attempts to think about how to value in an economic sense, um, environmental preservation. I should say, so uh, I, should, I should have emphasized that um, Pinchot claimed the, the title conservation for his approach. Conservation was all about for human use. The Muir side didn't like that so much, but they were kind of losing that. So the word preservation captured what they were at. Anyway, there were some early attempts then in the late 30s and 40s um, to start thinking about how to value preservation non-uses of uh, the environment, and they weren't very successful at first. So one example of this um, is in benefit cost analysis of water projects. This is probably where environmental economics were started really cutting its teeth on some of these issues. And of course, the context here with benefit cost analysis for dams, like the Hetch Hetchy Dam, is we're developing, we're developing resources, especially in the American West, we're trying to develop the West um, to foster economic growth there. And as always, there are bureaucratic pressures to increase the benefit cost ratios to justify more projects. Um, so that the, the Corps of Engineers or Reclamation could build more dams and do more work. So global constituencies could get more uh, development in their districts and so forth. In a weird kind of way, I won't go into it turned out it also, um, um, if you could increase the benefit cost ratios through other kinds of benefits, um, it could be a subsidy to farmers. So the economists um, were pressured to increase benefit cost ratios and bringing in outdoor recreation as a benefit seemed like one way to do that. So if we could monetize the value of the recreation opportunities from building a lake um, when we build the dam, uh, more fishing, more boating on the lake, then, uh, then we could pump up those ratios. That was kind of the pressure. And the economists were being pressured to monetize those recreation benefits to pump up that benefit cost ratio. And they didn't know what to do. And they were trying different things and they were thinking about it. And uh, Roy Pruitt, the chief economist of the Park Service, did this survey of very prominent economists in academia. And almost all of them, with one exception, said it can't be done. You can't do it. Don't even try. Now, in his summary report, Pruitt said the following. He said, recreation is, first of all, an intangible. It's intangible. It's not materialistic. It's a service. It's not a standardized or homogenous service. It varies with every individual, and it cannot be considered separate and apart from the individual. It is of the mind and of the body. It cannot be stored or transported. It is a psychic value, and it not, cannot be measured in objective terms. Finally, the recreational values supplied by the National Park Service are not sold for a price under marketplace rules. There's no price we can look at. It might be better than to forget the words economic value of recreation and focus attention on the expenditures induced by recreation. So going to hotels and buying bait and tackle and so forth. It is in this area that an objective approach can be made. So, the, the kind of immaterial, spiritual, intangible values of nature, we can't value it. If we try, it's gonna be lame, it's not gonna be objective, it's not gonna be scientific, so let's not try. That was where uh, the economists were in 1950. We can see similar frustration um, in another place, in the work of uh, the famous, um, interdisciplinary thinker, um, Aldo Leopold. Now, Leopold uh, was trained initially as a forester. He went to Pinchot's Yale School of Forestry. He basically wanted to follow Pinchot in, in uh, Pinchot's footsteps, 
when, when he was starting his own career. So he went to Yale. Um, then he went into the Forest Service and he started his career basically thinking like Finch. And then slowly, as the Forest Service itself was changing, we started thinking a little bit less about just the um, consumptive uses of the, the, the forests and started thinking a little bit more about multiple purposes, fostering recreation and so forth. Still pretty narrow instrumentalist values of nature. Um, until famously one time, um, Leopold, um, who was hunting and killing wolves, since they were killing other game that he even wanted to hunt, he killed a wolf, uh, approached the wolf and saw the fierce green fire die out in her eyes. And, and seeing that he sort of had a kind of conversion um, and, and, and came to the conclusion that, that we were missing something in the way we were managing nature and natural resources. And he left the, the Forest Service then and went to the um, University of Wisconsin in the Agricultural Economics Department, which was um, pretty inter interdisciplinary. And, and I should emphasize that Leopold had had an interdisciplinary training at the Yale School with, with some economics in there. Um, so here he is in an in a interdis interdisciplinary school, but, but <laughs> kind of economics department nevertheless. And he's thinking about the role of economics in understanding the value of nature. And he comes to the conclusion that there's not much role for economics. And again, it's, hurt, it's, it's um, counterproductive to try. In his famous book, A Sand County Almanac, which came out just after he died prematurely at the age of 60, he wrote, sometimes in June, when I see unearned dividends of dew hung on every lupin, it's a picture of lupins there. I have doubts about the real poverty of the sands in his sand county in Wisconsin. On solvent farmlands, lupins do not even grow, much less collect a daily rainbow of jewels. If they did, the weed control officer, who seldom sees a dewy dawn, would doubtless insist they be cut. I wonder, do economists even know about lupins? And then he goes on to say, one basic weakness in a conservation system based wholly on economic motives is that most members of the land community have no economic value. Wildflowers and songbirds are examples. Of the 22,000 higher plants and animals native to Wisconsin, it is doubtful whether more than 5% can be sold, fed, eaten, or otherwise put to economic use. Yet these creatures are members of the biotic community, and if, as I believe its stability depends on its integrity, they are entitled to its continuance. When one of these non-economic categories is threatened, and if we happen to love it, we invent subterfuges to give it economic importance. At the beginning of the century, songbirds were supposed to be disappearing. Ornithologists jumped to the rescue with some distinctly shaky evidence to the effect that insects would eat us up if birds failed to control them. The evidence had to be economic in order to be valid. And he doesn't say it here, but you can you can feel um, his belief that he's saying this to 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 base the values of nature in sort of what we would call today ecosystem services. It's just so lame. It's just really pathetic. Is Leopold's conclusion? And so he wanted a more interdisciplinary approach where we um, where we think about the aesthetics and ecological value of things, not the economic value. Economics will still be important because incentives are important. We need to get incentives right. But to base the value of nature on an economic calculus, no, you can't do that. And so that's where, that's kind of the view, both by the economists and, I don't know if we'll call Leopold an economist or not, but someone on the fringes of economics. That was kind of the view of economics and the place of economics in environmental policy into the 1950s by just about everyone. And now I want to bring in my hero, John Crutillo, into the, into the story. Um, Crutillo was uh, an economist trained at Harvard, a natural resource and kind of development economist. And he started his career um, at TDA and then went to Resources for the Future, still early in his career. And uh, he was basically doing what I would call um, cutting edge, but conventional benefit cost analysis. Um, 
of things like dams, like so many economists were doing at that time. And uh, a leading publication of his was Multiple Purpose River Development, um, co-authored with Otto Eckstein at Harvard. And they looked at a number of products, you know, they set out um, some theory and then they did a bunch of case studies. One of them was at Hell's Canyon Dam on the Snake River um, in the upper Columbia area. And, uh, you know, they, they, they did some analysis of that. They looked at um, a three dam project. They looked at a one dam project. They said, well, actually, you know, two dams in between would be better. Um, but they didn't look at environmental values at all. And they, they mentioned it. They said, well, you know, there's the beauty of uh, the canyon. We should, we should bear that in mind. But these are what they called extra economic considerations. So that's outside economics. Economists can look at the material stuff. There's that other stuff. Yeah, maybe it's important. We should bear that in mind, but that's outside the economic calculus. So it's still there in 58, they're kind of thinking like Leopold and uh, the park economists, uh, like Pruitt and the economists he had surveyed. And then sometime in the 1960s, he did um, a rethinking of that. And he pivoted to reconsidering the conservation approach in economics that um, was inevitably tied to Pinchot's kind of logic. And what he wrote in his 1967 ex, uh, essay is the following. He wrote, the traditional concerns of conservation economics, so using that term conservation tied to Pinchot, those traditional concerns, husbanding of natural resource stocks for the future, for the use of future generations, may now be outmoded by advances in technology. On the other hand, the central issue seems to be the problem of providing for the present and future the amenities associated with unspoiled natural environments. When the existence, just the mere existence, of a grand scenic wonder or a unique and fragile ecosystem is involved, its preservation, so they're kind of tying into to Muir's language, its preservation and continued availability are a significant part of the real income of many individuals such as the spiritual descendants of John Muir, the present members of the Sierra Club, the Wilderness Society, co-founded by Leopold, and others to whom the loss of a species or the disfigurement of a scenic area causes acute distress and a sense of genuine relative impoverishment. So what he's saying here is that economics has been limited to thinking about the environment the way Pinchot has, had been for the last 67 years. And it's time to break out of that constraint. We need to appreciate the kinds of values for the environment that Bureau was talking about too. The basic point he's making is that there is a trade-off between development and preservation. So you can develop a resource like Hell's Canyon on the Snake River, or you can preserve it. You can't do both. And therefore there's an opportunity cost. If you develop it, develop it it, you can't preserve it. If you preserve it, you can't develop it, at least not now. And then he says, just love of nature, of a grand scenic uh, landscape or an ecosystem, that counts. That counts when we think about this trade-off. People love something, that should count. It's a significant part of the real income of the spiritual descendants of John Muir and so forth. Um, and so this, in this article, he coins the term that we call today existence values, just, you know, value for the mere existence of a thing. So, and this is sometimes also called non-use value or intrinsic value. I'll come back to that term intrinsic in a moment. Um, I need to move along a little bit. So I think I'll skip over a section here. Um, let me just say briefly that, that, that then, um, Krutilla goes on to give some empirical content to that point. And he basically um, argues that, that the value of development is decreasing because the, the material products we get from developing resources or harvesting them, it's, they're becoming less valuable as we get substitutes for those inputs. And on the other hand, the value of preservation is increasing as we lose these scarce environments. Um, which are irreplaceable and don't have good substitutes. Um, he gets a chance to um, revisit 
the Hell's Canyon debate, when the development, when a, a further development um, that was being planned um, gets kicked back to the planning stage by the Supreme Court in a very important case called Udall versus Federal Power Commission. And now he gets to um, testify um, in, um, before the FPC in, in um, further deliberations. And he says, we should not develop. The value of preservation um, is too high. And um, he's got some arguments for why it's not too high. We're going to now, but suffice it to say that, that he is now making an economic case that the value of preservation is higher. What changed between Kutila's first book, 58, where he's still kind of locked in that impasse that um, had been left behind by that Pinchot Muir debate, and 1967? Well, three things I think had changed. First of all, there is now a new post-war environmental ethic and environmental politics. You can't really talk about environmentalism as a movement until the post-war period. You had that earlier conservation movement of Pinchot. But as the um, historian Samuel Hayes has, has discussed, um, we now have a new kind of idea as the, of the environment as kind of a consumptive good, um, a higher kind of aesthetic consumptive good, um, but we're valuing it for those kinds of reasons at a popular level, rather than as a material input. And you see this across the board in all sorts of things, including um, new bureaucratic um, management of preservation, so, um, you know, um, game wardens are, are now, you know, wildlife managers instead. Um, you also have, secondly, new work on the demand for um, the environment, um, especially on that recreation issue that I had talked about. So ways of measuring what people's demand is um, by looking at their travel patterns for recreation and also using surveys. Um, that new work created a kind of a way to think about the value of preservation um, and non-consumptive uses of the environment. And then I think also particularly important is we get a new definition of economics as being about opportunity costs and trade-offs. So before the 1960s, textbooks would define economics as being about material welfare. So when economics is about material welfare, it's not surprising that the economists in about 1950, they're looking at how to value recreation. They're gonna say, well, this isn't really about material welfare. It's about something intangible. So it's not economics. And it's not surprising you get your till us in 58 that, that the preservation values of the canyon are extra economic considerations. But now when we define economics as being about opportunity costs, and we recognize that there's a trade-off between development and preservation, then we can have an economics of the environment. So you get a switch in thinking between what we have on the left when economics is material development, pincho kind of stuff, and preservation is about immaterial things. You get a trade-off economics versus the environment. And you still hear people talk about this, this way at a popular level today. But that's the, that's the thinking until Kutila's article. And then when Kutila says, well, no, it's about trade-offs. We have a trade-off here between preservation and development. Then we can have an economics of the environment. And instead of having economics on the axis, economics goes to the, whole, to the top of the whole thing. And we have just material wealth here. And economics is about the trade-off between the environment and material wealth. So this is a what we economists call production possibility frontier. You can have a lot of material wealth and not much environmental quality or a lot of the other or something in between, but there are trade-offs to be made. And that was Grutilla's main point. Was Grutilla successful? Might depend on your point of view. Yes, in that he made an argument for why love of nature counts in the economic calculus. And he could incorporate Muir's kind of thinking into Pinchot's framework. On the other hand, you might argue that he's also subsuming Muir's approach into um, Pinchot's framework. And so really Pinchot's winning here and not Muir. Um, it's a little, you know, it's a little bit ambiguous as to who won the day there, if you want to go back to the Muir-Pinchot um, debate. Cortilla wants to have it both ways. 
So this attempt at having it both ways has been called what um, by Baird Callicott truncated intrinsic value. So Muir was arguing that, well, you know, Pinchot was saying, I forget intrinsic value. It's just anthropocentric value. It's what humans want and need and can use in a narrow and materialistic way. Muir said, no, things are value in themselves. The rattlesnake was Muir's, uh, Muir's example. This truncated intrinsic value, um, that's kind of Kutila's approach, it's still human-centered, but it's not narrowly instrumentalist anymore. So we can value nature for itself. And that counts in the economic calculus, Kutila says, but it's still us doing the value. It's still, um, humans are still the source of the value. So um, Calicott has said it's anthropogenic. So we're generating the values we humans, even if it's not about what we get out of it. It's not anthropocentric in that sense. So Calicott has also made the distinction that's value. We can say nature is valuable for itself, but not in and of itself. It's us doing the value instead. So it's kind of a halfway. Um, with my remaining time, I want to back up a little bit and ask, um, given that kind of truncated instrumental value, what does it mean for values to be people-centered? And there are at least, there are more than three, but I'm going to highlight three con conceptions of people-centered values, anthropocentric values. The first is utilitarian. The anthropocentric means what kind of pleasure or joy or satisfaction do humans get out of something? And based on that, that's how we're evaluating things. So that kind of value can be very hedonistic. That was Jerry Bentham's approach. It was just how much pleasure we get out of things and whatever you like, you know, whatever floats your boat, that counts. That, and that's all it comes down to. Whatever you get pleasure in, fine. Um, John Stuart Mill wanted to elevate utilitarianism a little bit more than Bentham. He, um, took the critic of utilitarianism, from, the criticism of utilitarianism, that that's kind of just, that makes us no better than animals. And Mill wanted to say, well, now we can think about higher pleasures, uh, doing good, do, uh, doing well, um, intellectual pursuits, and say that these higher pleasures actually give us greater pleasure, and so um, give us more points in the utilitarian calculus. But it's still a kind of utilitarianism. That's one conception. Uh, a second is um, a libertarian approach that it's, it's about what we choose, not what gives us pleasure, whether higher or animalistic, but just what we choose, whether it gives us pleasure or not. Um, Milton Friedman, Friedrich Hayek, um, a number of libertarian economists famous for that point of view. And a third that I'll kind of put off a little bit is um, a civil civic Republican, kind of approach where it's more um, a politics rather than an individual calculation. Uh, this brings me um, to some economics, um, to some uh, mathematical economics. What neoclassical economics was doing in the late 1800s was trying to reconcile those first two, the utilitarian and libertarian approaches. And others, including Mill, you know, tried to reconcile them as well, but, but economics certainly was, that was part of economics, um, neoclassical economics uh, mission as well. So they wanted to bring together the utilitarian approach where people, um, or what we value as people's um, pleasures or satisfaction and the choice-based approach. And you can do that if you say, people are good at maximizing their utility and their choices therefore reflect their utility. And then we can learn something about their utility by looking at their choices. So let's think about their utility in terms of the mathematical function here, where we get a certain amount of utility or satisfaction based on how much of different goods and services we have or consume or enjoy in some sense. It doesn't have to be materialistic consumption. And then let's think about the change in utility to a first order approximation that's gonna be all the changes in the things we consume or enjoy, whether it's positive or negative, times our marginal value for those things, and then you can sum them all up. That's gonna be an approximation of our change in utility from the change in goods or services we enjoy. 
Right now, going back to that idea that people are actually maximizing utility and they're doing it subject to a budget constraint. So their job is to choose some X's to maximize utility such that they don't spend more than that. So all the X's we could buy times their price, that's how much we spend on one good, sum up over all the goods I, that's how much we spend in general, it can't be less than our income or our wealth. Okay, then as many of you will know, um, this is a kind of constrained optimization problem and the engineering solution to this um, from the 1700s is that we can maximize a function where we put a constraint that the, the income minus how much we spend goes in that function and it's weighted by kind of like a punishment factor. So if we consume more X, it increases our utility, but it punishes us if we consume too much X to um, exceed our income through this factor. Anyway, so you can model this as maximizing that Lagrangian and you get a first order condition from calculus that our marginal utility for a little bit more X is, well, it's equal to lambda times the price of that X. Where am I going with that? Well, let's go back to the expression that I had just a moment ago that the change in utility to a first order approximation is the change in the X's times their marginal utility. Since we are good at maximizing utility, we're solving those first order conditions according to the neoclassicals. So marginal utility of a good Xi is equal to lambda Pi. And so I can substitute that in. And then I have that expression. The lambda is a constant, I can take that out. And then I can take it over and I have this expression here on the second line. And what I find is that the change in Xs times their prices is proportionate where lambda is the proportionality factor to a change in utility. Of course, we don't know what the units are of utility are anyway, and we can always take a proportionate factor when we measure anything, right? We could go from feet to inches and multiply by 12 or whatever, just to change in units. So we basically have a measure of a utility change right here. And what is this? This is the change in GDP. We normally do it in percentage terms, you could divide by baseline GDP, and that's the change in GDP um, right up there. So GDP becomes a kind of welfare measure. And we could take something like augmented GDP or green GDP that includes the environment in these eyes. Of course, we don't know what P is for environmental values. And so that gets us back to the economic problem that Grutillo was talking about. That neoclassical approach said that the P's are equal to people's marginal willingness to pay. So for environmental goods, we could just go right to people's marginal willingness to pay for those goods without the actual market price. And we try to get that willingness to pay through surveys or by looking at choices about outdoor recreation, residential location, health inputs, and so forth. I have about seven minutes left. Now that works great if people are good at maximizing utility. What if people don't maximize utility? Now, now we got a few different moves we could make. We could retreat. We could say we're not looking at willingness to pay for the environment, but we can still use economics to try to get um, any environmental policy we have as efficient as possible in the sense of reducing the material um, development, the, de the development of material resources or the consumption of material resources, reducing that as little as possible for any gain in environmental preservation. So thinking about that trade-off in as efficient a way as possible, even if we don't know the exact extent to which we should be making the trade-off. So we could think of the carbon tax or cap and trade as a way of achieving some environmental goal at a cost minimizing way, even if you haven't gotten the right level of carbon reductions in some economic sense. So we can take that retreat. A second approach is to commit to consumer sovereignty. Say, so, well, even if people aren't maximizing utility, we should still look at their choices. Um, we should still look at their marginal willingness to pay anyway, because that's what their choices are and people-centric, uh, people-centered policy means looking at people's choices, what they value, what they reveal they value through their choices, even if it doesn't make them happy in any objective sense. Robert Sugden, 
There's one economist who's made that argument forcefully. Or you could make the other commitment, commit to utility. Say people aren't so great at maximizing this, so we have to nudge them in different ways to change their behavior so that they maximize utility better. Then we might replace the prices in our augmented GDP, not by marginal willingness to pay, which comes from people's choices, but with other kinds of metrics. And I think Arthur Grimes' talk, um, what, a month ago or so, um, comes in here. So a lot of the happiness research is ways of coming up with the weights on environment in augmented GDP kinds of calculations or embedded cost calculations that aren't necessarily tied to people's willingness to pay. So, so if people aren't great at maximizing utility, we get some choices on how to do the people-centered approach. I think I can take a minute on this, just as an example of how you might um, think about these kinds of questions in a very pragmatic way, or how they show up, how they turn up when you're making um, pragmatic considerations about doing, say, benefit cost analysis, or thinking about values of air quality improvements, or thinking about cap and trade or pollution taxes. Think about two candidates for valuing an improvement in air quality. One approach is to say, well, we can look at property values. It makes sense that the demand for housing is higher in a, in a nicer area, right? We all know this. And that um, the demand for housing being higher leads to higher prices of housing in nicer areas. So areas with lower crime, and better schools, and just more attractive environments, those are going to be more expensive neighborhoods than areas that are not so nice. And we can look at that difference in property values between the not so nice areas and the nice areas and, um, and look at that difference in values and say, well, this is how much of a premium people are willing to put on the niceness of the nice area. And that's their value of the niceness. And we can look at that for air quality improvements among other things. So areas with better air quality as opposed to polluted areas. Look at that difference in property values, other things equal, that's the value of the air quality. That's one approach. All right, a lot of economists take that approach. And then others will critique it and say, yeah, but that depends on the demand for the housing in the clean area being higher based on the real value of the pollution or the reduction in pollution. But do people really know that the air quality is better there? Even if they did, would they really know how much it affects their health, how much damage the pollution is doing to them if they live in the polluted area? I don't think they do know that. So I don't trust these kinds of um, studies to give us the value. Instead, we should do something like we should look at objective science, look at um, a, a linkage, a chain of linkages of effects. We have some pollution that comes out of the smokestack, goes downwind, it changes air quality concentration downwind. So many people live in that place downwind, and they breathe it. And then the epidemiology tells us that has these health effects on them. And then eventually we'll put value on those health effects by how much damage it does. Maybe we trust those studies on the value of health effects, but not the housing studies. All right, so you can, and if you want to be utilitarian and not look at people's choices, you might look at that second value, um, that second approach to valuing instead of the first. If you want to just say, hey, you know, people are revealing what they reveal about their values based on where they live, you might take the first approach. Just a couple minutes now um, to mention one possible third way. A third approach would say kind of a pox on both your houses and say, you know, the real issue here is that you guys are all thinking about human-centered, people-centered values in a very individualistic way. But it doesn't have to be individualistic. It could be a group, a social, a political, political in the best sense of people talking together and reaching some um, kind of agreement about the way to govern um, um, the city. Um, so we can think about it um, that way. And um, some economists and their social scientists um, have advocated this approach and they've um, advocated what they call multi-objective benefit cost analysis. The Harvard Water Program 
which had its heyday in the 1960s and 70s um, with some famous economists, Robert Dorfman, Otto Eckstein, who co-authored that book with Krutilla, Stephen Marglin, many other uh, political scientists, engineers involved in that, in that effort, in, in interdisciplinary effort. And, and they said, well, we should think about the group choice. And to get a sense of how thinking about group choice could be different than individual choice, think about the following possibility. Suppose we wanna know about um, some different policies and um, one policy is gonna save the lives of young people and one will save the lives of older people. And we wanna know which investment to make. If we look at individual values, we might find that young individuals seem to be making trade-offs that suggest they're willing to make dollar risk over life trade-offs and such and such. And older people are making trade-offs suggesting their value of reducing risks is higher. Well, if we look at those individualistic trade-offs, we might say, well, it looks like the older people are valuing risk reductions more than the younger, so we should make the investment that protects their lives. But suppose everyone, young and old, when asked the question, which policy do you prefer? The one that saves young lives and the one that saves older lives, suppose they all preferred one that said younger lives. Well, which one would you do? <laughs> would you take the individualistic approach and do the policy that saved the older lives? Or would you take the, the um, social deliberation approach and pick the one that saves younger lives? Depends on whether you're, you're taking an individualistic or a group kind of rationality here. So Dorfman, one of the economists in that Harvard Water Program, he said this. He said, trade-offs between development and preservation, like what Coutillo was talking about, they're not questions of fact, like Coutillo thought, they're not. Not questions of fact that might admit expert answers, but questions about social values and public preference that only the elaborate and clumsy procedures of democratic decision-making can answer. Such answers are not data be, to be fed into decision-making, but rather outputs of those processes. So the idea is going to be, let's look, well, let's first figure out what the trade-offs are. That's a question of fact. How much material wealth do we lose if we improve the environment in such and such a way? What is that trade-off? And then kick it to, political representatives or some kind of political process to make the choices off that set of trade-offs, what economists call the production possibility frontier. Then once we know what the political process, how they make the trade-offs, then we can further um, refine our policies to try to get that trade-off better. So it's kind of an iterative, iterative approach. So let me just conclude here by asking what is the role for economics and science more generally, um, given these um, considerations? Traditional benefit cost analysis would say that we should, we can and should judge policy options by their relative optimality, which one is more optimal than, than another, and then advocate for policies um, accordingly. And then if policymakers get it wrong, we can say, hey, you policymakers, you got this wrong, and criticize them. Um, the multi-objective benefit cost analysis approach would say, no, it's just our job to inform policies. We're not the decision makers here, so we can't judge them. We inform and then we respond based on what the policy making process says is the priority. And then we can respond to that and try to achieve those priorities. And then of course, we could ask what is the role of EDF and other organizations and academics like me um, in those kinds of policy processes. And with that, I'll kick it back to Paul and to others for um, further discussion. And thank you for your time. Thanks, Spencer. Uh, I think I've been asked to just launch into my comments. Um, so not hearing any objection from you or from Susie, I'll go ahead and, and do that. Uh, I appreciate uh, your talk. Uh, I've learned a lot from reading your work over the years. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be able to offer a few comments. I'm a philosopher. Um, and so as a non-economist who studies philosophical issues that arise within economics, I definitely welcome the conception of economics that uh, we get from Krutilla, the one that you described being concerned first and foremost with trade-offs rather than concerned solely with the material determinants of welfare 
uh, to the exclusion of you know what some call the, the term you used intangibles like the like the natural environment. Uh, but even after widening the set of goods that are relevant to economic analysis, um, the dominant approach, uh, and I don't mean to be telling you, Spencer, anything you don't know uh, here, uh, the dominant approach to valuing goods in environmental economic, uh, economics does remain preference-based. The methods you, you mentioned, contingent valuation, stated preference techniques, those are all geared at trying to understand what people's preferences in fact are. And uh, I can certainly understand why there's this trend in uh, economics and environmental economics. In contrast to many of my fellow philosophers, economic, uh, economists tend to be uh, averse to what they sometimes call paternalism. They don't want their own judgments about what gives life value or how to determine trade-offs between uh, different goods or values, whether that's lives or something uh, 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 less momentous than lives, to be the fundamental source of values in, in their economic analyses. But even if uh, economics tends to be allergic to paternalistic ingredients, if we can use that term, I think it's worth noting that paternalistic anthropocentrism uh, isn't uh, strictly a contradiction in terms. Um, that would be the view that while the only things that matter are benefits and costs to people, still some things can benefit a person without first being the object of that person's preferences. Maybe experiencing pristine wilderness is good for me. Uh, it's in my interest, even if I'm not actually interested in it. Uh, this distinction between, uh, uh, you know, different conceptions of welfare, one of which is preference-based, one of which is maybe more objective. Um, it's pretty familiar in contemporary moral philosophy, but it tends not to be at center stage in economics. And again, I, like I said, I, I understand why. But let's focus now on the brand of anthropocentrism that you focused on, Spencer, the, the, or focused most on, which is the, the preference-based variety. Uh, what I'd like to highlight, I think, is that the preference-based uh, version of anthropocentrism is an approach to benefit and cost valuation. It's not yet an approach to how to aggregate benefits and cross, uh, costs rather, uh, across individuals in order to facilitate an overall evaluative appraisal of, of some policy, environmental or otherwise. Another way to put that is that there's more, I think, to what you uh, call the economic calculus, or what you called in the talk at one point, uh, than just the human or person-centered approach to valuation. Um, and again, I don't think you would disagree with this, and so I thought I'd use uh, these comments to sort of pick that thread up. So let me uh, mention two possible approaches to this aggregation issue. That is, even if we said that uh, benefits and costs should be uh, uh, viewed through the lens of what people in fact uh, prefer about, um, uh, uh, about the world and their lives. Um, what to say about this aggregation issue, aggregating those values across people from a social standpoint? Well, first one might choose to aggregate individuals' willingness to pay for a given policy change. You mentioned that, Spencer. Alternatively, one might wanna aggregate the real changes in welfare that a policy would bring about. The first approach to aggregation, the willingness to pay approach, is the one taken in standard textbook benefit cost analysis, uh, especially in the United States. It's tied to so-called compensation principles, um, which underwrite tests that ask, would, this, would the winners of this policy uh, uh, be able to fully compensate the losers and still be better off than they were before? Uh, that test doesn't say that the winners would have to compensate the losers. It doesn't say that the winners would have to be those who are the worst off in society. The winners could actually be the rich. Uh, and the test just asks whether or not they could compensate uh, the losers who may not be the rich, who may be the poor. The second alternative approach to aggregation, not just focusing on aggregating willingness to pay, uh, is the one that's concerned with real welfare changes. Um, and not merely with potential compensation. It's the one, for example, that's required for imp implementing any genuine version of utilitarianism. Uh, it's the approach taken in some areas of economics, not many, optimal taxation for sure, and in some 
uh, integrated assessment models of climate change. And Spencer mentioned integrated assessment there at his talk. Now, it turns out that your approach, one's approach to aggregating benefits and costs across people has important implications for how to value benefits and costs to individuals. That compensation test requires that we focus on individuals' willingness to pay, what they're actually willing to pay. Uh, we might not have an infallible way of getting at that, but we would have to use techniques uh, that economists have to, do, to, to, to study that. Um, and that willingness to pay based approach not only precludes reference to paternalistic determinants of well being, because it's, again, it's what people are in fact willing to pay for, but it largely renders irrelevant the fact that more welfare is created by benefiting a poor person than a rich person if the benefit is the same sized benefit, the same good, the same service. Meanwhile, all those forms of utilitarianism, which aren't focused on what people are willing to pay, but in fact, try to get at the real welfare changes uh, that people experience with a change in either what they command in terms of resources or a policy that lets them do new things or protects them against uh, environmental hazards, for example, that sort of framework absolutely requires that we pay attention to that uh, diminishing marginal benefit of income. The fact that as you get richer, less well-being comes from a, a dollar spent on, on you. Now, in addition to those implications for benefit and cost valuation, the two different approaches to aggregating costs across people um, are predicated upon radically different answers to the normative question about what makes a policy a good thing to do? Is it sufficient merely that the winners of the policy could compensate the losers? That currently is the test that is used, uh, for example, by the federal government in cost-benefit analysis, uh, explicitly cited, for example, in the technical support documents uh, concerned with the social cost of carbon in the Obama administration. And my guess is it's going to be mentioned in the documents that get released uh, by the Biden administration within the next month. Or should we instead be interested in actually improving the world by improving the sum total of human well being? I think it's clear that there's a, a real difference here between philosophy and environmental economics uh, on this issue. Many, I won't say most, many environmental economists, many, many, I will say many, many, uh, they appear to be happy to use this uh, compensation test criterion for what makes a policy a good thing. What benefits society. And they therefore value benefits and costs uh, using willingness to pay. And I, like I said, this approach precludes, uh, or I, I gestured at this, but um, this approach does preclude what has come to be called equity weighting. That is uh, uh, paying attention to the fact that different welfare changes uh, uh, come from benefiting different people uh, to the same degree if one is rich and one is poor. And if strictly applied, this focus on willingness to pay and compensation tests calls for valuing the lives of people in low-income countries much less than the lives of people in high-income countries. Some people on this call might know that exactly this issue uh, became controversial when this differential valuation made its way into the IPCC's second assessment report in the mid-1990s. And I guess I'll say I'm guessing that uh, the Biden administration is really actually wrestling with this question right now as they uh, uh, work to update the social cost of carbon, because it's a question that they have to address. Um, and uh, like I said, the, the trend in United States cost benefit analysis is to use this focus on willingness to pay with some fudges that are sometimes made, and we'll see if that happens. By contrast, the genuinely utilitarian approach to aggregating costs and benefits across people, uh, typically uh, does adopt anthropocentrism. It focuses on benefits to people, but it also brings this form of equity weighting right in right from the start. Uh, to me, that's a virtue of it, and um, it's one I'd like. I wanted to highlight. So, how do we choose among the benefit cost uh, approaches or the approaches to aggregation and benefit or cost analysis? Well, I think it's clear, or at least it's clear to me, that we shouldn't just look to people's revealed market behavior to answer the aggregation question. Aggregation is a social issue. 
evaluating overall changes to society is a social issue and the market choices of largely self or household regarding uh, uh, individuals or, or, or households uh, uh, isn't the right data for that. It isn't the right sort of consideration. Alternatively, we might wish to ask people directly their views about uh, uh, how to evaluate changes in policy. Spencer referenced this, but it's not clear why people's responses should be seen as, well, a decisive for sure. Most people haven't given much thought to this sort of question. I guess I would say something similar too about the civic republicanism that Spencer ended with. While society's actual decisions about trade-offs may be able to tell us how societies actually aggregate benefits and costs across individuals, that doesn't yet fully answer the normative question about how they ought to do that. We know that social policies sometimes are shaped by factors other than reasoned argument, sometimes. In the end, I guess my main message is this. Even if we adopt a consumer sovereignty preference-based approach to benefit cost valuation, I think we can't get around the need to engage with philosophical argument, ethical argument when dealing with how to aggregate benefits and costs across people, not only within the same nation, but across the world as, as needs to happen in uh, uh, climate change policy analysis. I guess one way to put this is to say that even if Muir is wrong about the intrinsic value of nature, we can repurpose his thought that the true value of nature is distinct from how we happen to care about it. I think economics could benefit from philosophical reflection on the reasons and arguments that there are to aggregate in one way or the other, rather than merely looking to the reasons that have been or are influential in real world decision making. That's not the sort of consideration that Spencer mentioned, I don't think, so I wanted to put it on the table. Who would you consult? Well, I mean, the Biden administration's uh, or Biden's uh, executive order about the social cost of carbon said, consult ethics experts. I've had a few calls with the Biden administration. I don't know if they've done anything more formal than that. I would desire something more formal than that because um, ethics and what ethicists and philosophers have to say is a relevant input and it should be done in a uh, systematic way and not with one-off calls. Uh, but it's, we're far from incorporating these sorts of considerations in a systematic way. But this sort of engagement with philosophical argument by economists is not actually all that uncommon in climate economics, but from what I can tell, it's definitely not the norm in environmental economics more generally, and I'd like to see a little bit more of it. I hope some of that if not all of that is friendly to what Spencer said, and I uh, look forward to hearing him respond to any uh, questions uh, if people have them. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. That was that was very friendly, um, very fruitful, and um, I think I agree with just about everything you said. Um, <clears throat> maybe, um, Susie, what do you think? I'm thinking maybe the thing to do is to um, give people a chance to ask other questions, and, and we can have a, a broader um, discussion for a while. I think if people have questions, it would be a great time to bring those in. Um, I think otherwise, I mean, I always have questions, but but I'd like to open the floor up more generally first. And I'd also just be interested in hearing some more backwards and forwards between you two. So anyone want to take the floor? Okay, I'll take that as a sign of, wow, um, <laughs> I digest that. This has been really a challenging thing. Um, it's so great to hear a really rigorous discussion of, of issues that, that I personally have thought a lot about, but, but not with the level of, of thought that you guys have put into I'm it. Sorry, I have questions sorry, Hillary. about Manilov and David. Ah. So we're going to start okay. with Brilliant. Manilov, who is from the EPA, give me one second. I'm going to click allow. Hi, um, thanks, I learned a lot, um, unsurprisingly. Um, one common challenge we have in thinking about a cost benefit analysis is that subject to all the concerns y'all raised, uh, 
we can do a reasonable job of characterizing some cost or benefits, but not all. Um, and how should we think about what to do with this sort of partial cost benefit analysis? You want to take that, Spencer? Uh, sure. Um, I mean, it's it's hard, right? I mean, I, I think it's I think you know it, it it's going to depend partly on what the purpose of the benefit cost analysis is, um, whether it's to make a decision according to a decision rule or to inform a decision. And and of course. Um, if you're just informing a decision, it's easier to just take the posture that, well, we're giving you some partial information here. This is what we know. And uh, this is what we don't know. And then um, human beings make decisions in that kind of situation all the time. So uh, it's not surprising that policymakers um, have to either. Of course they do. It's always partial information that they're, they're working with. So I think just to be frank about that and then, um, um, then to be a little bit more humble about uh, what your decision is um, based, you know, or, or, or excuse me, your recommendation is based on say the benefit cost analysis and to highlight, you know, and to highlight those um, and to have qualitative discussion. If, if I just could respond to that question too, I, I agree with everything that Spencer said. Um, in addition to not being able to quantify or to value uh, various types of benefits um, that economists themselves would typically like to do, there are a number of values that lie outside of a cost benefit framework generally. I mean, maybe it could be possible for economists to try to put a value on human rights violations, for example, or the, the under fulfillment of human rights. But often economists will say that's not even the sort of benefit that we are trying to uh, quantify. So they might say, we want to quantify, we'd love to be able to value uh, uh, the effects of increased conflict that might come with migration from climate change. That's something we'd like to do, but valuing human rights, how in the world would I do that? And I think that just compounds the, the stance that, uh, or the rationale for the stance that Spencer articulated, which is being absolutely open and uh, comprehensive about what's not uh, included in a cost benefit analysis, and then um, studiously not making a recommendation on the basis of what you've done. There's no basis to make a recommendation if you lack so much of uh, what seems intuitively relevant for making a, uh, a choice. So a cost benefit analysis could inform, but should never be presented as uh, even a qualified recommendation. Uh, and I think that's a category mistake that sometimes doesn't get acknowledged uh, in this space.